will do. All right, thank you. Uh, hi, everybody, we're back. Um, our final panel today covers probation and restorative justice. Restorative justice is in many ways a tool alternative to criminal legal system that uses ancient yet innovative conferencing techniques to repair harm that someone has done. And probation in some ways is the ultimate alternative to incarceration because of the large number of people on probation who may have otherwise been in jail or prison. Again, we have another amazing uh, panel. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, Sujatha Baliga, is that close? Baliga, uh, she's the Director of I uh, Impact Justice Restorative Justice Project and uh, a 2019 MacArthur uh, Genius Grant uh, recipient. Uh, Nicole uh, Kirk Aldi, she's the Program Coordinator for Yolo County District Attorney Neighborhood Court Restorative Justice Program. Uh, John Keene, who is the Chief Probation Officer for San Mateo County, as well as the Secretary Treasurer of the Chief Probation, uh, uh, the Chief Probation Officers of California Association. And we're waiting for uh, Katie Dixon, who I will introduce when she get here. Um, thank you again all for joining us. Sujatha, if you could start us off for five minutes. Sure, can you all hear me okay? Great, okay, so uh, warm thanks to the committee for uh, this invitation. And let's just start with a little bit about what's restorative justice. I think because the term is used by so many different people in so many different contexts. Uh, I like the way that Howard Zare, who's called the grandfather of restorative justice frames sort of these three questions, which are um, instead of asking who was harmed, sorry, instead of asking what law was broken, who broke it and how should they be punished? Uh, we ask a different set of questions. Who was harmed and what do they need? and whose obligation is it to meet those needs? So you think about that really as a paradigm shift in the way in which we think about harm. And what does that look like in practice? Ideally, it's face-to-face -face dialogue and consensus-based decision-making in which those who've ca caused harm are held by their families and communities directly accountable to their crime survivors' self-identified needs, right? And that can take a bunch of different forms like circle process, conferencing, et cetera. At the Restorative Justice Project at Impact Justice, uh, we work in the context of helping communities and uh, their systems partners nationally and uh, a lot locally and in, here in California as well uh, to implement restorative justice diversion in a pre-charge felony context. Uh, and we're also working um, with nascent, in a nascent way with intimate partner, uh, sexual violence and domestic violence. So um, over the past 10 plus years, we've done a lot of practicing, implementing, researching to determine the best way to do this. Uh, and in that process, we've uh, really boiled it down to these eight elements uh, that are really data-driven. Uh, and you can learn more about that at RJD, that stands for Restorative Justice Diversion, rjdtoolkit.org. Uh, and some may say that our holding to these eight elements um, might make us like the perfect being the enemy of the good. And, and what our data shows us is that's quite the opposite. Um, and that when eroded and compromised restorative models and approaches might serve some limited good, uh, both in, in any individual case uh, and limited in terms of the numbers that can happen, um, they're not really gonna rely, uh, reduce our reliance on criminalization and mass criminalization. So the data bears this out, it's in our memo. We really ask you to look at the fact that there's 91% survivor satisfaction with the program in Alameda County. With, we've seen a 44% reduction in recidivism uh, with an, out in uh, a randomized control trial recently out of San Francisco. has shown astounding results, 13% uh, recidivism rate as compared to the, uh, con the, the youth who were criminalized for the same crimes, charged with crimes, 53% recidivism. That's quite a comparison. Uh, there's also astronomical cost savings that vary based on jurisdiction. Um, and so uh, those are sort of our three big uh, data-driven wins on the work we've been doing over the past decade. Um, and um, the question is, can community-led and driven restorative justice be scaled in this pre-charge context? And the answer is yes, if you have the right causes and conditions. Uh, to make such a thing happen, right? And one of that has been uh, the blessing of getting to work with progressive prosecutors across the nation who are willing to do this in a way that sort of holds up to these elements that, that we hold to be necessary for good restorative justice. 
um, and legislation has a limited but powerful role to play in all of this. So we've offered you some do's and don'ts in our seven page memo that we shared with you. I'm gonna highlight them really briefly. Um, and uh, one is to really encourage pre-charge felony diversion instead of making this an add-on uh, to other things. Uh, there's a lot that can be done in the confidentiality department, restorative justice works at its best when people can be honest and real and when the threat of a process uh, resulting in information being shared back to systems partners in a way that can lead to convictions uh, or records at all uh, really reduces the truth telling that is central to restorative processes being effective. Um, and so there's quite a bit that can be done there in terms of legislation. And then uh, standardizing access, uh, discretion. Oh my goodness, one minute left. Um, discretion really uh, is the gateway to discrimination. And so there's a way in which legislation can encourage uh, a standardization of processes that our progressive DAs across the nation have been willing to participate in. Um, so the don'ts, I'll let you look at those. I just want to speak really briefly in my one remaining minute um, from a personal note, and that is a survivor of child sexual abuse, rape, campus sexual assault, um, and in working closely with survivors of domestic violence uh, for decades now. Uh, when I think about my own childhood, I think the very systems that were in theory designed to protect me were what ensured my silence as a child and what I see with many of the survivors I work with. Uh, we aren't looking to have folks necessarily locked up. We stay in relationship with the people who harmed us. And the Office of Violence Against Women nationally has shown us incredible data, right? 50% of survivors of these crimes don't contact the system at all. Of those who do, 20% say it made them less safe. Um, and so with that, I'll just close uh, with um, just wanting to speak for those survivors nationally who are looking for something different and who believe in the possibility of change. Uh, for people uh, in our communities who cause harm and the community's capacity to uh, attend to those harms. So thanks so much. And I'm happy to answer your questions. And, Thank you. Uh, I'm sure we'll on. have plenty, especially about how to implement that into to law. Uh, Nicole? Hi, good afternoon. And thank you for um, having me here. Um, so I work with the Yolo County Neighborhood Court Program, which is run through the Yolo County District Attorney's Office. Uh, we are a pre-plea uh, diversion program. We divert both pre-filing and pre-trial. Uh, and so when we were looking at, you know, some of the supports that we would need through the penal code to better implement our program, the three main areas that we focused on were in in our office, as the DA's office, one of our major concerns is supporting victims and seeking justice for victims. Uh, on the same hand, when we are handling cases for our participants, we want to offer them every benefit of diversion that we can. And so in balancing the needs of victims and the uh, offending participants in our program, one of the issues that we come up against a lot is restitution, obtaining restitution for a victim uh, and ensuring that that is collected and that there's supports for that without negatively impacting uh, the potential participant who, depending on the amount of restitution, may have different barriers to being able to complete that in the timeline that would normally be afforded through um, a diversion program, especially for a uh, pre-filing pre diversion, which has certain time limits. Um, there are requirements there that are kind of bound in the statutes. And if we're not able to uphold those in a timely fashion, it can impact all parties involved. So one of the supports that we would look to, or one of the ideas that we had was in perhaps having that be entered as a civil judgment without a plea, uh, some sort of capacity to ensure that there was a mechanism for collecting restitution without preventing a participant from engaging in this type of process, which is gonna be beneficial to them overall. Um, one of the other components that we see for our participants, we've handled over 1,400 cases, uh, misdemeanor cases, we have some felonies, and we're really seeing this program expand to kind of cover some of the gaps between uh, felony level collaborative courts and the misdemeanor diversion that was uh, more prevalent. We're now handling felony cases uh, the needs of our participants is expanding. And as we try to make this program available for a wider population, uh, their needs are gonna change. 
And so we need to make sure that they're really truly able to access all the benefits of diversion uh, and that once they complete whatever level of diversion they complete, they're able to have their cases dismissed, closed, and their records sealed in a way that's understandable and functional. Uh, our office is not able to fully guide people in that process. And so if, if that structure was more streamlined or even automated uh, to some extent, that would really allow people going through this process to ensure that they're seeing the full benefit of their participation and their engagement. Uh, finally, one of the questions was engagement uh, statewide, nationwide. Uh, as a program in Yolo County, we've seen interest from other neighboring counties, uh, other states even, uh, restorative justice, alternatives to incarceration. It really is something that has a lot of support and is growing. Um, one of the issues that we see a lot of times is, is having the community structure and the funding to allow that to happen. Um, in our county, we were, we're primarily grant funded, uh, which has enabled us to expand and encompass uh, not only our base neighborhood court program, but also to cover a lot of mental health and uh, substance use specific diversion options uh, that might not have been available to us otherwise. We've partnered with community organizations uh, who provide the supports for that. Uh, but grant funding is not always secure. It's not always consistent. Uh, and having a diversity of those options available to a wider swath of the population would make this really a component that would be doable for more counties uh, so that we could have crossover, have some of the overlap that you see in probation where cases can transfer in and out as they need. Uh, we want to be able to have that kind of continuous nature throughout different counties that want to make this available. Sorry, thank you very much. Uh, I know that we've kind of consolidated two somewhat disparate uh, uh, ideas into this panel, but uh, Chief Keene, I was hoping you could talk a bit about probation, particularly um, the supervision that uh, somebody might be sentenced to probation how you approach that and um, how that might be helpful to alternatives to putting people behind bars. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And I really appreciate it, your introduction as that probation is kind of one of those ultimate alternatives to incarceration because we really see ourselves as just that. Um, I'm here representing uh, the California probation chiefs. And really what that means is that we represent public safety and justice through the lens of correctional professionals. Uh, we really have a shared identity as law enforcement leaders because we feel like we understand what works to curb future crimes and victimization. Um, specifically, we believe crime prevention and avoidance is the best form of public safety. And when we do research, evidence, and data, and use that to guide our system, we create opportunities, we believe, to move forward towards our ultimate goal. Resource supports that reductions in crimes are best achieved by interrupting the criminal cycle and changing a person's long-term behavior by addressing their thought processes. We believe that in California, this is what community corrections ultimately is. The interrupting criminal cycles uh, requires balancing the necessities of accountability as well as well thought out interventions that include proper programs, services to address reoffending, uh, re but also their criminogenic and non-criminogenic needs. While ac accountability is a key to a client's success in terms of his journey, we believe that a healthier and safer lifestyle really can be achieved through also including uh, stability factors like housing, employment, food, health care, and oftentimes behavioral health care needs. Probation is not just focused on accountability. We believe that oftentimes we are the main person that our clients see in terms of being able to connect them towards other services they may need in the community. Healthcare primarily is one of those that stand out for me. Um, at the center point of California's public safety, probation feels like we are trained and highly connected professionals that ultimately work closely with all of our criminal justice partners to make uh, ultimately the achieve of uh, rehabilitation possible. Although I know many of you understand what probation really is, I just kind of want to take a step back and just talk about 
legislatively what probation is. Probation is judicially imposed suspension of sentence that attempts to monitor and rehabilitate offenders while they remain in the community under the supervision of a probation department. The statutory role of probation has changed significantly as a result of many statewide policies and changes. In addition to supervising offenders sentenced locally, probation departments are now responsible for supervising post-release community supervision offenders, uh, known as PRCSs, that come back from CDCR. Local probation departments also represent and are responsible for community supervision of local prison offenders under uh, Section 1170H of the Penal Code more no commonly known as mandatory supervision. Probation is the most commonly used sanction in the criminal justice system. In our most recent data pools, probation represents and supervises over 40,000 PRCS offenders, over 12,500 mandatory supervision uh, offenders, over 255,000 formal felony probation supervision offenders. So that total, we are approximately looking at over 355,000 adults who are supervised on some form of probation throughout California. Probation plays a critical role in both pre and post sentencing. Probation is part of local county government, which allows for innovation, local responsiveness, and most importantly, targeted community engagement for those we supervise. Over the past 10 years, California has seen tremendous change and success in how we approach individuals in the criminal justice system. Through AB, uh, excuse me, AB, through AB 109, Senate Bill 678, and most recently SB 10, probation has demonstrated the ability to take what's offered to us at the legislative level and provides additional supports for people at the local level. The success of these policies have helped to not only impact the state system, but has also helped to evolving probation practices and cultures at the county level. Utilizing these, excuse me, I lost my train of thought there. Utilizing these approaches, we've been able to make lasting impacts on the public safety system as a whole and create frameworks at our local level that really focus on working with our clients in a more client-centered way rather than simply about compliance-driven modalities. Probation is an alternative to custody and represents a tool that holds accountability and helps rehabilitation through and throughout the entire process by using research-based, evidence-based practices. For instance, a person who has risk factors that include substance abuse has the underlying need to engage in substance abuse treatment. Without addressing the underlying need of substance abuse treatment, we will not help this person be successful. Ultimately, that is achieved through the hard work of probation officers, community-based organizations, system partners, and the like, all focused on a client-centered approach which is really geared towards a more holistic approach of supporting this person's future. And then lastly, I know there's a lot of conversation about um, ideally what probation uh, looks like and how improvements can be made. But one of the things that's important for us to recognize is that California probation is very far ahead of the curve and what's happening in a lot of other places across the nation. Uh, we've led the way in detention reform, the use of evidence-based practices, making CBOs in our communities and really leading a client-centered approach towards supporting those that we supervise. Our goal is to only improve that further as we move into the future and I look forward to asking any specific questions you may have. You're on mute Michael. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Dixon, uh, we'd love to hear about your experience and, and recommendations that you might have for us in terms of uh, improving probation and alternatives to incarceration in general. All righty. Good afternoon. I'm looking up at the clock trying to gauge the time. It's safe to say good afternoon because we're all here in California. A lot of my Zoom meetings I've been on have been with people um, in various different time zones. So I always look at the clock before I do my greetings. Thank you all so much for having me on. Um, I'm assuming some of you all know my name. It's Katie Dixon. I go by KD and I'm formerly incarcerated. Not sure if that was obvious or not. Um, 
I work today as a community organizer with Legal Aid at Work, and we are focused on the implementation portion of California's ban a box law. I am proud to be working at Legal Aid at Work, working on this issue that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm also a proud member of All of Us or None. I am hoping that folks on here is familiar with All of Us or None that way. I can kind of skip some of that stuff. And yeah, so I'm grateful to be here. I'm humbled to be here. And thank you all so much for having me. Today, you know, I have been free from prisons and jails for about six years now. And I do definitely give credit to a diversion program. I know that's the topic, that's what we have on today, that's our focus. And I do have to give the credit where it's due, you know. I was fortunate enough, and I say fortunate enough because there's a lot of talk around these nonviolent versus violent offenders. I'm fortunate enough, I, I, I am a violent offender. Um, I was also a useful offender, and so that's why I say I was fortunate enough to be able to be accepted into one of the toughest diversion programs here in California, and that's Delancey Street. I'm not sure who on here is familiar with the Delancey Street program. Um, I was accepted to the Delancey Street program between the years of 2012 and 2014. I was facing about six years in prison. Um, and that was two different counties kind of running everything together. If the charges came out of San Francisco County for possession of a felony possession of a firearm, in some form of possession of um, crack cocaine for transportation. I'm not sure what the stipulations and the numbers and all that stuff is. And that's how I landed at Delancey Street. Um, Delancey Street is a really unique diversion program. I'm not here to brag and promote Delancey Street because you know they're very private in the way that they operate. But I am here to promote diversion programs as a whole. And some of the components that I really like about Delancey Street is that they are really unique in the fact that they are, they are super inclusive with the way that they operate and how they offer their service, excuse me, their service to its participants. Um, one of the main things that I believe this program is successful in setting up folks like me who are, is not on their first chance. You know, I may not have been on my second or third chance. Maybe I was on my fourth or fifth chance. Again, I had all type of um, crimes. Everybody is not a low level offender. You know, I was a violent offender. So the Lancy Street accepts violent offenders. They also, does, they also do not accept no form of government funding through no type of contract with CDCR and probation and all those type of things. And I do believe that that is absolutely important. And I do believe that that absolutely factors into the success rate and how the Lancey Street kind of sets people up to move on with their lives. Um, I had a three year probation term. That's kind of typical. Um, and I think we have seen some of the statistics of how, you know, that first three years is really critical for someone. That first three years is critical for you to find a job and for you to find housing, for you to get whatever treatment folks are trying to shove down your throat. And um, you know, to also still hold on to your dignity and find some type of restorative justice process if that's what you need to heal yourself and move on with your life. Um, so that first three years is critical. And the Lancy Street, they're heavily focused on, how do I wanna say this, jobs through skill building. And they have various different vocational components that I personally believe is what carried me through to success. Because Delancey Street only took up two years of the three year probation term that I had. And again, they were focused on jobs. They were focused on skills, making sure you had a tangible, these are the words they used. And it proves to be real true right now in the midst of COVID-19 where folks need to re and get new jobs. They focused on having a tangible, marketable skill that will be 
seen as an essential skill to where as a formerly incarcerated person like myself, don't find myself always unemployed at the drop of a pandemic or something like that. So I do believe that that's a part of the Lancy Street success that that's built into there just that and also another component that I believe is a part of their success that definitely I believe could be replicated and skilled is they have pathways to self-sufficiency. So if someone has like this exorbitant child support case looming over your head, the Lancy will help take steps to arrest that, to help you fill out whatever forms. I don't have children, so I don't know the forms, but whatever forms that will let them know that, hey, I'm not earning any money right now, could we put a pause on this? The Lancy Street help you, I'm a commercial, I hold a commercial driver's license in the state of California. That's because of the Lancy Street. These are what I mean by self-sufficiency, a pathway to sustain yourself. These are some of the real components that I believe make that program successful and the people that come home that carry them through to success. Because at the end of the two years, that level of support stopped. Delancey Street only offered that support while you are there. Right. They do have an outside little network, but you have to be someone that has been there for like X amount of years and just all this and that. For the people that's going to do their two years and move on, that level of support stops. So that left me with a year to kind of navigate on my own. I wind up homeless. I did wind up working various different, what are we calling it right now? Service sector jobs, right? That right now we're relying on these grocery store workers and all these kind of things. And then some of the first people that was losing their job, restaurant workers, those were the type of jobs I found myself. Probation, unfortunately, I hate to say it, they simply didn't offer me any type of help. Wait, Ms. Dixon, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. We'll get, I want to get to your experience with probation, but I want to open it up to questions, uh, yeah, questions. now. Um, and Sujatha, I guess I want to start with you, if, if you don't mind. I think one of the most promising and interesting things about at least my understanding of restorative justice and what you had spoken about was that it not only um, addresses um, the needs of the victims in particular cases. Um, I'm gonna get off this call early too. So I'm not gonna be able to stick around for uh, Q and A. Okay. Or longer. All right, would, as long as you can stay would be great. Um, so not only addresses the, 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 the needs of victims, um, if I'm phrasing it right, but really also does result in dramatic improvements in public safety in terms of reductions of recidivism. And, um, the, the guidelines that you suggested about sort of ideal legislation, it's one thing to work with a terrific prosecution office, and that's what we've sort of seen throughout today, right, would be a collaborative courts or diversion programs or whatever, but are there ways that you could imagine that people, um, how, would you, how would one implement a, a statute that um, advanced um, a, a successful restorative justice program uh, and I imagine that would be like, in, you know, we've talked about going to some drug treatment program or domestic violence program, but you would go to a restorative ju justice program. How could statutes help foster that? So I think that there are a few points. One um, is particularly around the confidentiality matter, right? So one of the real struggles that we have in restorative justice processes um, is that uh, the, the success actually lies in a community-based organization that's situated outside of, um, out, outside of a probation department, outside of a DA's office, going to a young person, going to the person who's caused harm and saying, you know, your case has been diverted pre-charge, you're not even going to be charged with this crime, right? Work with us and we can help you make it right directly with the person that you've harmed and nothing you say can be used against you in a court of law, right? And so you know, to the degree to which that that is true within any given jurisdiction where a DA can sign a memorandum of understanding in every jurisdiction we work in, our DAs sign that memorandum of understanding. That's a heavy lift politically for some district attorneys across the state. There are some who have said, oh, I'd love to sign that, but I can't, right? And so, and then there are the DAs who have less political um, 
concern with that or that it's an easier lift uh, where they're situated. And so if it were uh, in the same way that attorney client privilege might work or other types of things we can think about uh, the relationship, it might be a new immunity that is developed that is in relationship to use immunity or, you know, so there's, there's, there's some elements of all the different types of immunity and I think it'll take a much longer and deeper conversation and some significant research uh, with the attorneys that we have on our team uh, and others um, to develop a type of restorative justice immunity that can lead to survivors getting exactly what they want, which is the absolute truth from the person who harmed them. Uh, and so I've been in processes where I, I either see them working really well in the fully pre-charge and ideally even pre-booking context where there is this um, immunity offered um, and then sort of 25 years post-crime and it process inside when all the appeals are, are done and then there's no more fear that something can be used against you and then all the truth can come up then too. And everything in the middle, survivors don't get what they want, which is an honest answer to all the questions, right? And so that's what is, one piece. Let me just Sorry, go ahead. Let me interrupt and then I'll get to you, Justice Moreno. So the idea is either pre-booking or pre-charge, you're referred by the court, I guess, to this third party nonprofit organization that is specially trained and certified in some restorative justice certification process. And that if they can successfully complete the restorative justice process that this third party has developed, uh, then the then no charges are ever filed. And right. and so it's but important that's, to that's not say model. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm really losing, um, I'm having trouble hearing you. And I'm not sure if that's me or... I'll get closer to the, to the computer. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what's going on with that. It might be my computer, but um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I don't want to so, monopolize the time. Justice Moreno had a call, a question. And his, and his mic might work better. Can you, oh, can you unmute me? Yep. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. All right, great. Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, how do you get, uh, in the first instance, survivor buy-in to this? I would think that in many cases, particularly sexual assaults, date rapes, campus-type related things, uh, particularly stranger-to-stranger -stranger assaults, that it would be almost impossible to get survivor buy-in because they would be so angry and want justice mm -hmm. done. Second, 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 I have two more points. Sure. Second, it seems that the penal code acknowledges that there are crimes committed against society, notwithstanding the victims or the survivor's position. And doesn't society have a, a legitimate interest in prosecuting crimes? And third, what do you see? It appears you don't see any role for the courts in this particular situation. It's all sort of pre-filing. Pre so yes. those are my three elements. Thank you so much for your questions. I, I very much appreciate them. So the first thing is that when you're really practicing restorative justice well, right, it is starting with crime survivors, asking them, how are you harmed and what do you need? This is really uh, sometimes the first time that a survivor has ever been asked these questions, rather than when, when I worked as a victim advocate prior to going to law school. And uh, it, there were circumstances under which my work as a victim advocate was really, um, to get the crime survivor to do what was needed for the prosecution. Uh, and that, you know, really honestly, my personal experience in working with crime survivors is that when we approach them from the perspective of how are you harmed and what do you need, their amenability to participate is, is quite high. Um, victim participation can always be higher. It's also about making the process completely amenable and trauma responsive to crime survivors issues, right? So, um, so how do we do that? You know, where is the meeting gonna take place? Um, what types of preparatory work needs to happen. Everything is designed to make the survivor feel safe and the, and the empowerment process really is about being oriented around the needs of survivors. That's our first element in our eight elements of restorative justice. Um, and so that's, that's the first piece that I would say. Um, I, I would again just return you to the reality that particularly in the context of intimate partner and sexual violence, survivors right. aren't reporting right? 50% of survivors don't tell the system. I never received system help. And so many survivors I know who had to testify against those who caused them sexual and intimate partner violence harm felt gaslit by the process, right? And so I think it's really important to not assume that the system isn't um, 
uh, that the, the system, the current system as it operates is meeting survivors' names and will do so better than restorative justice. Uh, so being survivor driven is really one of the most important pieces. With regards to society, right, when you look at our recidivism reduction, I think it's important to note then that society's needs are being met. Like what are our needs? Our needs are to live violence free. Our needs are to not have people burglarizing our homes uh, raping us, et cetera. Like, this is my need as a member of society. And so if recidivism reduction is lower, then uh, I think it's really important for us to think that it is actually in the public interest and it is in society's interest to work with those processes that actually are proving to be uh, more effective, right? There are many things for which um, the system is designed to do and can do well, right? Particularly in cases where accountability is central to restorative processes and where someone says it's not me and I'm not going to participate, but other people say it is, and maybe adjudication uh, might have some value there, right? But when people are willing, and most of my clients when I was a public defender were really quick to confess, right? I mean, once we've had an, an amenability um, that's to participation, um, I think that it's when we approach people from a strengths-based perspective, we do really, we do really well. And then I would say finally with regard to the courts, I mean, this is tricky, you know, it's, I have, um, I personally never worked in relationship to the courts. I think that there's a way in which third party deciders can actually undermine the, um, the um, autonomy of crime survivors. And I've never seen an outcome in a case that was really absurd. Uh, and I've worked on crimes of severe violence and I've worked on, um, and I've worked on, you know, lower level things. We generally don't go below the felony threshold, but lower level felonies. And I've, I've never seen crime survivors ask for nothing. I've never seen crime survivors ask for everything, right? Um, I find that people, when we're really working deeply with needs are, um, and, and what's needed, and, and really the, the, the plan to repair the harm has four parts, doing right by your survivor, uh, your parents or your guardians, if you have this, the youth you're working with, the community, doing right by the community is a part of the plan to repair the harm, and doing right um, by, by yourself turning your life around, right? And that plan has to be really well fleshed out. Um, and, um, you know, within three to six months, it's completed. And, and I think that recidivism reduction shows that ideally we will be lowering the burden on the courts and the prosecutors and the, and the system. And that is a part of the overall uh, way in which we return the responsibility to families and communities to help us be our brother's keepers and our sister's keepers. That is the purpose uh, of restorative justice, really. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Skinner? Um, actually, I had a question for Ms. Dixon, but it appears that she uh, got taken off. Um, I had wanted to hear her comments about probation, being a person that, uh, I think the only person that is uh, joining us today that was actually under that supervision. So I, I was looking forward to that, but perhaps we could engage her again at a future um, session. Certainly. And additionally, I just wanted to um, indicate that I was pleased that we had someone who is, uh, whose past experience was as a violent offender, because I think so often many of the, um, you know, when we get uh, le reform legislation through or even diversion courts and collaborative courts and all, the tendency is just to look at nonviolent or low level offense and somehow that those are the only, uh, and I don't, again, I'm not saying that everyone is of this opinion, but that somehow those are the only acceptable uh, people who have engaged in our criminal justice system that are rehabilitative or should be you know, treated in this different way. And um, I think that when we look at the profile of who is in our, um, state uh, facilities and even our jails, you know, obviously they're just by the category of crime, whether it had a direct, whether there was a direct violence committed against someone, it's still considered a violent offense. And so if we only focus our reforms on the quote unquote nonviolent offender, we're going to be missing a very large um, proportion of our population. So, and I know Sujatha, you just spoke to it to a degree, not, you know, kind of around, you know, a bit around about, but uh, I was hoping that we could hear from someone who is actually, uh, you know, categorized that way. But if, if you at some point, Sujatha, want to comment about restorative work with violent offenders, that would be great. 
Well, I, I actually, if, I, if you don't mind, uh, well, Sujatha, why don't you respond? And then I, I'd love to hear uh, Chief Keen's um, response and to whether or not violent offenders are appropriate for uh, probation supervision instead of an incarcerative sentence. Um, and, and why should we have exclusions? Are the exclusions right? That kind of thing. So why don't you start, Sujatha? So briefly, I have worked in crimes of severe violence um, in um, a slightly different context. Uh, the only really a case I've taken all the way through uh, in relationship to the system, right? So there's several cases where people approach, have approached me outside the context of my work at the Restorative Justice Project, but just so I've personally facilitated cases uh, where no one has called the police, no one is, and we've uh, come up with some really wonderful outcomes. This has not involved a homicide. The only homicide that I've been involved in uh, was one that we did in the plea context. So uh, plea conferencing is something that usually happens between two lawyers, right? And, and instead we use a restorative justice process for everyone to collectively come up with the outcome in a, uh, a plea situation, then that's what the district attorney took to the court. And so that was very effective in a homicide case. It was a teen dating violence case, heartbreaking um, and, and very effective. Um, you can read about that case in an old New York Times article. Uh, it has a terrible title because it conflates restorative justice and forgiveness, which I think are very different things. Um, it's called "Can Forgiveness Play a Role in Criminal Justice?" And so you can look that up and look a little. You can see a little bit more about what that posture can be. Uh, that being said, uh, even in the again pre-charge context, what we are seeing is that serious crimes actually an international um, metadata and and uh, different studies from around the world show that. Uh, violent offenses, uh, folks who cause serious harm of other types respond really well to restorative justice, that we see actually lower recidivism rates with the higher, the more severe the crime, the lower the recidivism rate. Um, we see that in a lot of different contexts uh, in the criminal legal system more broadly, but this is one that is equally true of restorative justice. Um, I honestly think that this is why we have to not net widen in restorative justice, because if it's low level stuff, then um, there's that that impact of your behavior uh, isn't really there. Waking up to the impact you had on another human being isn't there when it's like graffiti. It's like just dismiss that or find a, don't charge that in the first. There's so many times we're like, don't send that to restore justice. Don't charge that at all. Don't even think about charging that. Like that needs something entirely different. Uh, restore justice is for serious stuff. It works best with serious stuff. Um, so I will just leave it at that and leave space for others. Chief Keen. So let me begin by saying I'm, I'm always uh, encouraged every time I hear Sujatha talk about restorative justice as a as a model because I personally I believe in it and I think it's certainly an important element in totality of the system of the criminal justice system and often rehabilitative opportunities. And I'll tell you, I think fundamentally, I believe that everyone could benefit from from rehabilitative opportunities. So I don't believe that offense driven approaches are the best approach. I think when you look at kind of probation's focus towards evidence-based practices, where we try to look at the individual person, look at their individual needs, I think it's a far better approach. And then as you start to build restorative justice programs or diversion programs from that premise that we're trying to figure out what this individual person needs rather than this category of offenses as the driver, I think you have better outcomes long-term. Um, so I don't think fundamentally that it's a fair statement to say that all people who commit X amount of uh, types of crimes um, somehow avoid of rehabilitative opportunities. So I think that's a kind of starting point there. But I think the way you get there, and I think the way that you, devi you develop more of an appetite for providing diversion and other types of um, rehabilitative programs is making sure that the resources are available to provide those programs. Uh, I think it was mentioned earlier that really it's about the funding mechanism that helps to drive what can be supported within an individual jurisdiction. So what we see up and down, I think the state is that in some jurisdictions, there is more possible because they have more uh, programs available. They have more resources available that can kind of uh, drive some of these, this very innovative work. So I think if you uh, continue to make sure that the right amount of resources are dedicated to the concept as a whole, then ultimately you can find that there's an opportunity to maybe expand a little bit. Um, I think it's just sometimes we get really caught up in this idea that only thing we can work with are low level offenses because the general public feels kind of a degree of connection with that. You know, it's almost too much TV watching and too much law and order and too much of all those things 
And so we say, oh my God, if you've done this, there's no way we can rehabilitate you. There's no way we can do that. Um, but I think a balanced approach where you consider an individual person's uh, opportunities for rehabilitation is the better approach. Thank you. Uh, Assembly Member Conlogger. Great, thank you. And I want to apologize in advance if you start to hear some um, dog barking, but um, the gardener is here. And so we're on high alert. Um, so Jada, I just want to say um, that I was so intrigued with what you talked about around um, plea conferencing to collectively come up with an outcome. I, I think we oftentimes get lulled into this idea that defense don't know who their clients are. And I think that's a false narrative. I think oftentimes that public defenders and private counsel, they know who their clients are. They know what outcomes will benefit those folks. Um, and so having them involved in a conferencing um, as early as possible to talk with, you know, prosecutors, the DA's office and the courts about a collective outcome in my mind does make sense because if you have a client, you know what measures are going to yield the kind of success, you know what's appropriate. But oftentimes I think we want to assume that they're just all about letting every single person out and sort of um, dismissing um, the relevancy of the circumstances or situation. And, and we have to give folks a little more credit. So I was really intrigued by um, what um, you mentioned. I um, also just wanted to say that you'd mentioned that the community is also sort of having its needs met when we're talking about restorative justice. Um, and I'm, uh, I have been increasingly intrigued also with the notion of victim and who's the victim. You know, people um, that we've actually passed laws last year that said buildings were victims. So let's talk about that. But communities, and I, I would argue that I think the community is the victim when you see large swaths of its membership being incarcerated and traumatized for increasingly long periods of time. And so at some point, we as advocates in this field have to kind of talk about that. Um, and that it doesn't always mean you have to put folks away and if they go into this big box for long periods of time, then that's exactly what the community needs. I don't know that I've heard that in many of the advocate sessions that I've been in. Um, and restorative justice in my mind means like, how do you put everyone on the same footing? And I've been thinking a lot while listening to this panel, I've been thinking a lot about the gang statutes that we have and gang registries, you know? And the reality is, is that probably less than 1% of those folks in the registry are Caucasian or are other than black and brown. And so you have to have a honest conversation using data, not to steal from Dean Richardson, um, about what, <laughs> about, you know, kind of what we're doing and how we're designing and framing and encouraging and marketing systems that are racially motivated and racially designed that have, that are so far away from restorative justice um, as you can imagine. And so two questions out of that rant, I'm sorry, um, is so do you have any recommendations for this committee on how we can address those charged with violent crimes that we sort of talked about, but also not forgetting sex crimes because legislators get so nervous when you talk about sex crimes. Um, and so how do you help us find the courage to come up with some, you know, Courage through recommendations to deal with those two populations. And then what data do you have on restorative justice success that could also provide um, us courage um, in terms of designing recommendations to support that kind of expansion? Because, and Ms. Skinner can attest to this, when we have our public safety committees, the opposition is as long as a marathon in terms of what data do you have that's out here that shows that this can be successful. Um, so if you all, ha if there is data, you know, and recommendations that you would have to kind of allow us the courage to tackle some of these heavy lifts. 
Are you asking for data that is specific to sexual violence or are you, are you asking for like disaggregated data by crime within the felony bucket? Is that what you're asking? I would love that. Okay. Um, not necessarily on sex crimes, but we talk about, you know, we always talk about the non-non-nons. And then we kind of wade into the shallow end with violent crimes. And then somebody says sex crimes and everybody turns out the lights and runs away. So the, um, what I would say is, is that the full study has not yet been released, but the, um, the initial data is in, uh, George Gascon's, um, report. And those are all felony offenses that are being discussed there. All, all that San Francisco program is a discretionless diversion program where all cases that meet certain criteria are automatically referred to restorative justice. And we only agreed to do a randomized control trial, which to me initially felt like we're gonna roll dice about who who gets a program that I know is actually gonna be better. Um, But but the the underlying problem was that the the, uh, organization, Community Works West at the time, didn't have sufficient funding to be able to take all the cases that were then automatically eligible for restorative justice. And so through that, we ended up doing a randomized control trial. And those are all felony cases. And that's the one that shows the 13% recidivism rate as compared to the charged children. Charged, regardless of whether or not they ended up actually being adjudicated delinquent, just being charged with a crime resulted in a 53% recidivism rate. And so to this, and with all due respect, and I have very warm feelings about Chief Keenan and about all the wonderful probation officers out there who are, and chiefs who are doing incredible work. um, What we do see is that um, probation violate, with the programs that we've tried to operate in tandem with probation, probation violations actually are our driver of incarceration, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's this weird position that we're put in where the youth who are participating in restorative justice diversion programs through the community that are operating in tandem with probation are like, are you my probation officer? Will you tell my probation officer? And then they're getting in trouble about violations where with the restorative justice process, if they're falling down on their plan, right? If a kid is is smoking pot or something, right? We're not going to like, we're not going to violate them on their probation. We're going to have another circle with their family and community to figure out how to reduce that behavior, right? How to make that behavior, um, Mm -hmm. how to attend to that behavior, right? So Mm -hmm. these are the kinds of things uh, that I just want to name about my concern about everybody going, oh, let's do the plea conferencing. And this is because, well, as a, I, I appreciate what you said about, about um, public defenders having their clients' best interests in mind, but I also know that even when I was a public defender, I was like, what is the least exposure I can get my client? Right. right? So, so I, so, wanna, I didn't mean to suggest that either, because I don't always believe that to be the case. I was right. So when I was a public that. defender, I was interested in making sure that my client got the least exposure. And that my personal experience in working with defense attorneys who are engaged in restorative processes is that they cause the same problem that a lack of a memorandum of understanding that creates confidentiality causes, which is that the, that the person who caused the harm is less forthcoming about the totality of what they've done. And that is another reason why I want to do things pre-charge. I want us to not have any lawyers in the room. And I want like, as a lawyer, I would say I'd like the actual people to be <laughs> engaged with the grandmas and the sisters and the brothers and the uncles and the pastor of the church that the uncle goes to. And that these are the folks that actually produce the best outcomes not the lawyer. So that's why I really want us to keep in the pre-charge context, right? Um, With regard to sex crimes, like I just can't say enough. And I think that it's really important to actually get survivors to come testify for you and to say, please don't close the door to my getting restorative justice, right? And and this is a huge piece, right? So this is one of the most important things I hope to get across in the memo that I submitted to you. Do not close the door to more serious crimes. Don't create something that says, but not domestic violence, but not restorative justice. You're creating work for me to have to do later. (laughs) Like I'm being literally having to go to states where when restorative justice started in the 1980s and they started legislating stuff like in Vermont where they were ahead of everybody else. And they say not restorative justice. Now the very institutions that pushed for that, the domestic violence organizations are turning around and saying, actually, we desperately need this in sexual violence and domestic violence. And now we're having to undo all that legislation, right? So you don't have to close that door. You don't have to close it right now. You don't you don't have to say, but not in da-da-da cases. And there are countless survivors, as evinced by the huge movement of crime survivors for safety and justice, right? There's so many survivors that are not inclined towards punitiveness that will be here to back you up um, when, when people are pushing in that direction. So I would say, call on us. Uh, I'm always happy to say, not in my name. Actually, I need the opposite of that. And let me, exp- let me explain to you why, on a personal level and on a systemic level, why that will be more beneficial to me. 
I, I feel that a big part of the problem in moving things forward is that politicians rarely have the political cover that they need from crime survivors um, who are interested in solutions oriented things. And, and we're here, um, we're here to, to, to say um, things that are true from our own lived experience, right? Um, and that there are better ways to do things. So I don't know if that really answered your question. Um, well, I do wanna to just touch really briefly on this notion of exactly why we want to be really careful about what we legislate, is that I am concerned about things like excluding not just domestic violence or crimes, thinking that you're protecting survivors, but also things like um, gang involvement, right? Can be a thing that can exclude youth. And I, I, I work really hard um, and my team works really hard to make sure that that kind of stuff does not end up in our memorandum of understanding with DAs, that the gang involved youth can't be involved. I mean, that, that sometimes that's like everybody, right? <laughs> or all kids of color, right? Who are just automatically assumed to be. And so it's really important that you be thoughtful and not make political compromises. Why I, like when I was first asked about this committee uh, testifying, I was like, oh, I just want you to not do anything actually. <laughs> and that half the time people are proposing restorative justice legislation. And I'm like the restorative justice lady who's being like, don't do that. Right, don't, don't do that. That's actually gonna close the door to some really good work that's, we're, we're like three years out from that, or we're two years out from, let us build it uh, slowly and thoughtfully and carefully. And please let us be not judged by the fact that we are building it without any money, right? I think that is really an, another important piece. And I know that this committee is not talking about the cash as much, um, but it is really important to understand that you cannot hold restorative justice to standards um, that we can't possibly meet, whether data collection, that is another concern, like as long as they're data driven, well, who's funding the data collection, right? Who's funding, I mean, these nonprofits that are doing this amazing work uh, can't always prove it to you because studies are very expensive, right? So if we're gonna hold people to a standard, we need to fund them to meet that standard. And then, and then we'll see what the, what the results are. Well, you're lucky because California might run out of money, so <laughs> you won't have to deal with it. Uh, that was a joke. Nicole, I, I actually have a question uh, for you, switching topics a little bit. So you talked about collection of restitution as just sort of this now it just feels like low hanging fruit um, in terms of meeting both um, you know, victims needs or not meeting victims needs and um, ways that we can try to reduce burdens of, of prosecution and incarceration. Can you just tell us um, what doesn't work about the current system and how we might be able to improve just this sort of discrete area of restitution? Uh, so I guess one of the um, challenges that we have is that in, in handling cases, um, and just to clarify, um, so our program is run through the district attorney's office uh, but we have a community volunteer group who handles the actual um, hearing cases, communicating with participants, uh, reaching the joint agreements through a conference process with an objective facilitator. Uh, those agreements don't include any input or say from our office. They're not vetoed by our office. Uh, and those agreements are what the participants are then held to. Uh, in handling cases pre-filing, uh, we do have a essentially a time limit. Uh, so if a case is not completed uh, within a year of the offense date, uh, if that person then decides not to uphold their end of the agreement, we have no um, option. We have no ability to uh, handle that case. So in, in making cases available, uh, as we see higher level offenses, a lot of times the monetary uh, restitution amount, whether it's for damage to property, uh, medical expenses, uh, what have you, oftentimes those, those amounts are greater. Uh, and so to expect somebody to be able to pay that back within a year, then becomes a challenge and often a barrier to their participation, which is not what we want. Uh, we don't want to say, you know, I'm sorry, you don't have the financial means to pay this back in the timeline that we need, so you can't, you effectively can't participate in that program. Of course, they wouldn't be barred, but knowing that um, that restitution is part of their participation, they might make that decision themselves. Uh, 
and so not having any kind of recourse at this point uh, we can't have it go to like a civil judgment uh, because there's no plea involved there's no sentence uh, so we're challenged in in making this equally available to everyone who would be eligible uh, regardless of the restitution amount when the greater restitution amount can pose a barrier to those participants um, whose financial means not are likely not going to allow them to make any substantial you know impact in a short period of time that that makes sense um we have about five minutes left do other folks have questions from the members well you know i just had a, a question for chief keen i have to imagine that um during this COVID pandemic you all have had to do some things differently and probably you've had to insert a bit more flexibility in your operations can you sort of talk about um, if any of those could um, turn into long-term mm. recommendations for consideration for the committee? You know, that's a, a, a great comment, Assemblyman. I, I, think, I think really one of the things we've tried to do is kind of what probation often does, which is try to make things work um, in the best interest of the clients that we serve. Um, we certainly have made some adjustments around uh, what supervision looks like. Uh, you know, for example, uh, in, in this era of social distancing, uh, certainly we've been mindful of being respectful of our clients' needs in that regard. So we are utilizing other forms of technology to do supervision. Um, however, for example, service delivery, a lot of that is a, you know, um, a person to person game, so to speak. So we have been utilizing, um, you know, the appropriate uh, precautions, but, you know, we're still out there providing services. Um, giving opportunities to people, connecting folks to different services such as housing um, and different uh, medical needs and employment. Well, not necessarily as much as employment right now with all the challenges, but really a lot of the social needs around other things that families need. So when I think about where we look in the future, I do agree that some aspects of the way we do business um, can be potentially uh, reviewed for alternative measures. So I think that's really why this idea and and I appreciate your joke about us running out of money because you know the idea of looking at probation uh, terms for example and shortening those terms and allowing us to front load more services I think really is indicative of what we're doing right now. So I think what will can probably be projected into the future as a better practice is if we do find ourselves with the potential to shorten those terms, front load those services, we're going to take the lessons learned for how we've delivered services and some of the unique fashions in which we've done it and probably make that a part of our day-to-day our -day routine. Um, not so much has to be done um, in the office or making these direct contacts in the streets. We can utilize technology in ways in which we haven't done up to this point. Um, you know, the saying that, uh, you know, we have tried to figure out really how to kind of, you know, do this work in a way that is uh, even less intrusive than we've tried to be in the past. Um, I think that's a very indicative of where we are. So I think the short answer to your question is that there are a lot of lessons that we've learned uh, throughout this process that we think we can, we can move forward in a way that's only going to support rehabilitation and not hinder it. I have a question. Uh, are probation terms uh, statutorily prescribed or can judges and probation officers terminate early? So they're not statutorily uh, prescribed. They do have options and that uh, generally I would, uh, would defer to the two judges on the panel to talk about how they utilize their discretion, but there is potential for how probation uh, terms are doled out. Uh, there, you know, there are certain terms, uh, uh, lengths of terms, so for example, that are um, very specific to certain jurisdictions. Some people have five-year terms. Most people have three-year terms. Um, I've been a part of um, jurisdictions where they've done two-year terms at times. And so I think there's variance there. Oftentimes those terms are dictated by the amount of exposure that an individual has um, as a relation to the offense, but there is some degree of discretion here. Um, can you go back ways, and say, if you've been I'm sorry. Long, I'm sorry, so if you've gotten a three-year term, let's say, but you're doing mm -hmm. terrific, can the uh, probationer or can anybody go back to court and say, you know what, uh, she's done great, so let mm -hmm. her off probation? 
No, definitely, definitely. I mean, and, and quite frankly, many of our departments do that as a, a part of our policy where we've reached a certain mark where we take people back, uh, particularly if they've hit all the, the terms that were requested. So for example, they needed to complete a program of some type or uh, pay restitution uh, to a victim. Uh, once those things are done, particularly in the juvenile space, we're always looking to see how fast we can get people um, off probation who have quite frankly met the burdens. Um, I know that it doesn't always happen in every jurisdiction, so I can't speak to that. I do know in the jurisdictions I've been a part of, that's been a hallmark of the way we've tried to do business. Thank you. And we're almost out of time. Does anybody have any questions for this panel? All right. Um, Mike, can I ask one question real quick? Of course, Tom. <laughs> uh, Tom is our staff attorney, by the way. Hi, uh, Ms. Kirkcaldy, you, you know, you, your office is, I think, um, a leader in California amongst prosecutors' offices and, and a type of program you described. And you mentioned that you work uh, with other prosecutors in the state and, and the other state. I, I wonder if you could share with us some of the things that have prevented other offices from running programs like, like yours. Is there, because there isn't anything in the penal code, is there something else? It'd be great to hear about that kind of experience. Um, I, I... I really think a lot of the challenge boils down to um, funding and community resources that they can tap into. Uh, so our program really benefited from a major grant, uh, which allowed us to expand and partner with community uh, programs that were offering uh, different supportive services, social services, uh, resources related to substance use, alcohol use, uh, things like that that are really applicable when looking at uh, what does a person need uh, to address the root issue of, of the offense that brought them before the community group. Uh, and so offices that may not have that kind of funding, that kind of connection, and are looking to start something up and maybe have one attorney uh, managing a program or assigned to a program, uh, or, you know, one attorney and maybe one support staff are just challenged in how to, how to make something that's going to be operational and effective uh, and really reach the goals that they're trying to adhere to. Uh, it, even our program, it, you all talked some about, you know, who's eligible, um, what kind of scope can you have with a restorative justice program, and at the outset of our program, we had some of those same challenges. You have to have you know, community support and understanding. Our initial pilot program was for low level uh, first time offenders. That was kind of how we got our feet on the ground and started to attempt to you know, have a restorative process. Very quickly, we saw that you know, this is something that's beneficial, not just to first time offenders, uh, so we've been able to really grow that and make that available to more serious um, offenses and, and get that community support, but you really can't expand in that way if there's no, you know, connected resource for these people. You can't ask them to participate in a program if you don't have, you know, something, some sort of resource for them to engage in uh, that's really going to touch on some of the needs they have. Uh, and so kind of having the ability to expand in that way um, and build is, is really what I've seen as, as some of the challenge. Uh, just when we communicate with different agencies, depending on what their community uh, setup is like, what the public response is like, um, and honestly kind of what the political environment is like uh, to allow that. Um, so we've, we've been, you know, able to do some things that not every county has. Other counties have been able to do things that we're striving for. Uh, it's, it's been a growth process. Well, thank, you. thank you very much um, to all of you and to all of our panelists. Um, you've given us a lot to think about and chew on. Like I said, I promise we will be back in touch for more specific uh, feedback and help as we, you know, begin to think about and develop policies. Thank you so much for your time and uh, everybody stay uh, safe and well, of course. I hope that you're all um, okay. Um, the next 
uh, step in our in our uh, hearing or meeting today. It will be for the public comment. Um, we're going to take another five minute break. Uh, before we do, um, or during that five minute break, I would like people, uh, members of the public, who are interested in making a comment, to please uh, raise your hand electronically on a uh, not yet yet um, on the uh, on Zoom or dial star nine on your phone. Um, when we get back from our five minute break, we'll see how many people um, have a comment and um, I'll discuss ground rules. I will say that the comments that we'll be able to take right now are going to be very short given the number of people who are here and the time, and this has been a, a long afternoon. Anybody who wants to speak can, but it will be short. For longer comments or suggestions, I very much encourage you to email um, the committee and uh, I will get you, and those emails should be directed to the, the head staff on this, which is Tom Nosowitz, and I will get you his email. So if you have a longer thought or suggestion, those should be directed by emails. If you have something short that you'd like to address to the committee, uh, we'll hear you in five minutes and you can start signing up uh, now and we'll take you in order. Uh, so we'll be adjourned for five minutes. Thanks.
Okay, we're back. Let's just give everybody uh, a few minutes to get back at the table. I see a number of hands have been raised. Thank you. Or for those of you guys who want to comment, we're calling you in order. Mike, this is Brian. I also, I wanted to let you know that Senator Burton was called away, so he's no longer here, um, but we still have a quorum, so we can proceed without him. Terrific, thank you. Um, and um, another point of protocol is that um, for, for those of you guys who, for those of you who want to email uh, the committee, we will send out uh, a notice with the best way to do that. Um, so if you've heard about, the, however you heard about and got a link to this uh, committee hearing, you will also get a notification of the best way uh, to send us um, comments or materials. Um, all right, um, let's start with the public comment. Again, I'm gonna keep it short. Uh, please keep your comment uh, to two minutes just to be respectful of everybody's uh, time. And uh, as I said, we are genuinely interested in, in, in the points that you have to make. Um, and we will, uh, you know, make yourselves make ourselves available electronically uh, for longer comments and more materials. So, um, Tom, are you going to manage the the queue? Sure, I can do that. Um, right. First up is Stephen Monkelt. So you should be able to talk, Mr. Monkelt. Got it. I am the executive director of California Attorneys for Criminal Justice, CACJ. Um, we obviously are uh, a partner organization to the whole criminal justice system. Um, and we obviously also have a criminal defense perspective. I wanna thank the committee, its members and its staff for focusing attention initially on alternatives to prosecution and incarceration as we think that's the best path to a more successful community and justice system. And uh, we think um, one of the, the important components of, of a redirection of um, consequences after uh, claimed criminal conduct uh, to a, a better outcome is to divert these matters and these people as early as possible in the process. If we can single them out and separate them out of the out of the criminal justice herd at the pre-filing stage, that's great. Um, but it's it's even more important, or ultimately more important, to have them diverted out of the criminal justice process before there's a guilty plea or conviction. And that's because of the incredible collateral consequences, which are not only state but federal collateral consequences. And the current state of most of those is that they just last the rest of your life. There's no way to get out from under them. So getting people out of the justice system as early as possible is, I think, the, the goal. Um, having the resources to um, treat, support, and, uh, and, as, and advise these people is uh, critical to the success of any program. So that's going to be funding for agencies outside the court system to work initially with the courts, but then with the people. Um, and uh, we think it's a critical component of all of that process is to avoid having uh, law enforcement or prosecutors be the gatekeepers. They certainly are, are uh, the, a key component of the process and need to be involved. But when prosecutors or law enforcement are the gatekeepers, uh, exclusion becomes the rule rather than inclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, next up is Scott Seward. Hi, good afternoon. Am I audible? We can hear you. Right on. Uh, thank you, Michael and team for all of your hard work. I just found out about your committee, uh, gosh, earlier this week. so. I'm gonna, I'd actually have a quick question to pose. Um, let me introduce myself. Um, I'm president of Copware Incorporated. We publish the Penal Code, Vehicle Code, California Peace Officers Legal Source Book to peace officers in the state of California, our, is our primary audience. 
Um, and so the work you guys are doing will directly impact our work product potentially later in the year. My question to you is when, um, under best case circumstances, when do you think the initial uh, work product that you guys do that gets through legislation will actually start hitting the, the documentation, the codes? Oh gosh, um, I, I don't wanna answer everybody's question, but I think that the, the, I'll answer this briefly. Our recommendations are due to the legislature in January, so they couldn't be taken up until uh, next year anyway. And um, so we're still, you know, um, over a year away. I Very think. early. Great. Okay. Long runway. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Next up is someone whose name is Amanda. Hi, sorry. I'm just a member of the public, so I didn't really come on knowing that I was going to enter um, full name and full public disclosure. But anyway, so I do have a longer comment, but I'm going to direct that to the email. But briefly, I just wanted to say that Many panelists talked about uh, grants as possible incentives um, to district attorney's offices for to um, implement the you know the courts. And I want to point out that the grant um, um, some of the grants are actually being implemented to disincentivize district attorneys from implementing this. So, for example, Imperial County actually receives grants to prosecute charges that are handed down to the district attorney's office from CDCR, um, charges that are on state grounds. And they receive grants, and these grants directly feed into the district attorney's retirement fund. Uh, this is obviously like a conflict of interest and goes against the um, incentivizing for the collaborative court. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to kind of point out that this goes against the empirical evidential results that are being given with the alternative program. And so when we are talking about um, incentivizing through the district attorney's office, another approach might be to look at how everything is being utilized in terms of grants and funding that it will work against the collaborative effort. Thank you, Amanda. Obviously, any incentive that we would try to recommend would try to incentivize the, the outcomes that we were hoping for, not the opposite. Thank you, though. Next up is someone on the phone at, um, I'll just say the last four digits, 7166. Hello, uh, this is uh, Kyle Magallanes Castillo with Community Works. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to address the committee and its remaining members. Thank you so much for the panels you put together today. Um, you may have heard mention of our organization in one of your panelists' comments, Sujatha Baliga mentioned a restorative justice diversion uh, program, uh, actually two different programs, both in San Francisco and Alameda County. Uh, our organization is the uh, organization, the nonprofit operating those programs. So of course, wanted to echo many of Sujatha's comments, but also address some specific comments um, and questions that came up over the course of Q&A and discussion amongst the committee members. In particular, I just wanted to emphasize the fact that this type of intervention, this type of alternative, and this type of really pivot away from traditional justice Justice checks a lot of the boxes, regardless of where you fall along the spectrum of being a stakeholder in justice systems or really a stakeholder in society, in the sense that if you look at cost savings, you look at reduced recidivism rates, you look at victim satisfaction, and you look at the opportunity to really make sure that all members of our society are able to fully engage in society, regardless of criminal uh, involvement, uh, either as a young person or as an adult, then again, this is satisfying uh, all the types of needs that we have collectively as society, but also the types of political considerations that Sujatha and others have talked about, DAs and other system partners having to navigate, right? And, and although many justice reform efforts have become more bipartisan and less controversial as time has gone on, I think using restorative justice diversion specifically is something that becomes increasingly palatable, especially as folks like you and others have opportunities to learn more about the efficacy in those ways. Um, I also want to say that um, in DA O'Malley's comments, she mentioned and highlighted a, a number of very effective diversion programs in Alameda County in particular. 
Uh, the ones that she mentioned focused in two different areas, one in cases where people are committing much lower level offenses, and then on the other side of things, people who have committed multiple offenses. Um, with our restorative justice diversion programming, and again, at her Alameda County, as well as across the Bay in San Francisco County, these fit a, a bill that she did not describe, and that's in cases where it is the first offense for these young people, except those are serious offenses, and this is a serious intervention for those offenses, and I think that that really makes it uh, unique and, and uh, the u utility of this type of intervention is, is, is significant. And we've seen a lot of efficacy, again, in the, in our geographic service area so far, and we hope to see this, uh, you know, be the type of default, really, for our systems. And, and lastly, Chief Keen mentioned him being a believer in restorative justice as an element to, you know, the justice systems right now. And I would just argue that really this doesn't have to be an element element in, in the existing justice systems, but could be the alternative as opposed to part of a panel of alternatives as options, but really a restorative justice system as 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 what our system is. Thank you. Thank you. We're very interested. I am, I'll just speak for myself in restorative justice programs, although we, we want to heed Sujatha's warning of do no harm, right? We don't want to interfere. So please be, in we'll, you know, we'll reach out to you, but please be in touch with us too as we think through this really, I think, fairly new uh, area that we want to try to uh, advance. Tom? Certainly. Thank you all. Next person is going to be Mindy Boulay. Hi there. Uh, my name is Mindy Boulay. I'm an attorney at the Public Defender's Office in Santa Barbara. I've been working in as a public defender for over 20 years now, I, and I handle right now felonies and conservatorship cases. And I would like to suggest that um, not only do there need to be changes to the penal, code set, penal codes, but to also welfare and institutions code, because what would be really key is, uh, although 1001.36 is truly a step in the right direction, if somebody suffers from a severe mental disorder, they should really be diverted out of the criminal justice system and into a civil commitment system. And where it, it goes anywhere from outpatient uh, services where they just need to be checking in with their caseworker and taking their meds to something that's inpatient, um, going from boarding care to locked facilities, depending on the level of crime. But to have the collaborative courts, it's a great step in the right direction for a broken system, but really people with these severe mental disorders, they shouldn't be in collaborative courts. They shouldn't be in a criminal justice system at all. They really need to be in a civil commitment system that is specifically for the mentally ill. And, um, and so, I, you know, if, if there's any questions about that, if it, I, I, I would be happy to discuss it more with anybody, but, but changes to the WNI code that allows for a bigger diversion into that system would be um, of great use to the public at large. Uh, thank you, Mindy. You hit on two things that I, I wanted to just say briefly, which was uh, I certainly appreciate, I think we all appreciate how um, central mental health is to um, all the issues that we're talking about, although we may be talking about mechanisms like probation, alternatives to incarceration, uh, but mental health is obviously, um, you know, uh, a big frame on uh, that issue. The second is is that that you touched on is that our uh, jurisdiction is limited to the penal code, um, even though we um, obviously uh, inter interact with lots of other areas of the code. For example, the health and safety code um, mm -hmm. and the vehicle code, right? Um, so th those are things that we're also trying to think about where uh, this committee uh, can can be most effective. But thank you for your comment. Welcome. Next up is Urban Peace Movement. Hey, thank you. Hello? We hear you now. Okay, great. My name is EJ Pavia, uh, organizer with Urban Peace Movement, um, located here in Alameda County. Um, with our partner organizations, we've done extensive research around charging data here in Alameda County. Um, and we've actually created two lists that we'd like to email to you um, after this. 
Um, one um, are um, a list of offenses that are just we, so low level that we feel should not be charged at all. Um, and where appropriate should be considered for diversion. Um, the second is a list of wobblers that we feel should be charged as um, misdemeanors by default. Um, we've analyzed data from the DA's office and have also done two weeks of court watching in 2019 and have found that low level offenses on our list make up 50% of Alameda County's misdemeanor docket. Um, we also found that the wobblers on the list were charged as felonies 93% of the time. Um, so recommendations, um, I su we support um, pre-charge efforts that prevent net widening um, and DAs um, across the country have taken these innovative decriminalization efforts to decline to charge certain extremely low offenses. Um, however, this requires a DA initiative. So we would recommend that this con um, committee consider ways to address this issue through the penal code. Um, we also um, recommend and agree with the pre-charge diversion where appropriate. Um, to potentially address root causes such as real mental health, substance abuse, um, and housing emergencies. Um, and then finally, for the wobblers, two recommendations. Also consider ways to adjust the penal code to drop wobblers to, um, to misdemeanors um, by default and uh, potentially increase diversion opportunities through the penal code so that these wobblers are, di are diverted as misdemeanors um, so that they have a less harsh collateral consequences as um, Adams, uh, Anthony Adams mentioned earlier. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. We, I'd be very interested in that list. And even in just preparing for this um, hearing today, I was, I was surprised about uh, how, what a large percentage of um, cases, misdemeanors in particular, and, and then low level fel felonies make up of our whole justice system. As I said at the outset, 90% of all arrests in, in California are either misdemeanors or nonviolent crimes. Wow. So I would be very interested to see you. Yeah, we'll share all the data with you also. Thank you. Great, that's terrific, thank you. Um, I don't think we need, to, uh, Keith? Am I up? You're good. Yeah, Keith, you get the last word. Oh, the last word, okay. Well, um, Keith Watley from Uncommon Law. I, I really appreciate the work of this committee and, and really the great Great potential for change that it's, it represents. Uh, it's an exciting time. I, I'm really glad you had KD on earlier. I regret she couldn't stay longer. I wanted to hear more of what she had to say, but I, I really want to weigh in now to strongly urge the committee to ensure that that every one of these these meetings is informed by the, the voices of the people who've been arrested as kids and as adults and who've been on probation and who've been, who've been diverted and who've been to prison for violence and who've had to transform their lives in order to be released on parole. Um, I think you can't, we can't begin to understand all the dimensions of this process without those voices uh, because it's a very important perspective that I think will shed a lot of light on what, what those changes need to be. Uh, that's all I want to say. Thank you all for this work. Great. Thank you, Keith. Um, first of all, uh, you know, don't be surprised if we call on you to be a witness when it comes time to think about parole. Um, for those of members who on this panel who maybe don't know Keith, he's probably the best and best known uh, criminal parole attorney in, in California, if not across the country. Um, but um, Keith, just uh, related to what the comment that you had just made was, uh, is that um, one of the things that we've been discussing is about whether or not we can have one of these uh, meetings uh, in a prison actually, or, or jail or both, uh, obviously when the virus uh, health emergency is over, um, because we do want to try to get as many voices, um, of people who are system impacted uh, to contribute. And I, I know that there are experts from all different angles. So uh, I, I hear what you're, you're saying and we really do wanna to try to include all those voices and perspectives. So thank you very much. I hope you're well. Great to hear, thank you. Thanks. Um, with that said, I don't think that there are any more people who want to comment. Um, I am going to, uh, if, Brian, what's the magic word that I'm supposed to say? Well, you're going to recess. Oh, I'm going, we're going into recess until uh, tomorrow morning um, and uh, where we will have our deliberative part of the process. If the members could stay on Zoom just for one minute afterwards, I would appreciate it. Is that technically possible, Brian? 
Well, it's possible for them to stay on. I don't know how to, um, yes, uh, until one minute after, like right now? Yes. Yes, they could stay on for another minute. But uh, can we just have it amongst the committee members? Uh, technically, I don't know how to do that. And then also there's an open meeting issue depending on what we were Okay, so, so I'll just say this for everybody. I just wanted to say thank you so much for your time. It was a long day. Um, and, you know, we did it under extenuating circumstances. I hope it was helpful. Um, please email or text me if you have any questions this evening. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing you all uh, tomorrow morning to uh, discuss these issues further and how we might uh, proceed and prioritize them. So thank you all very much. Have a good evening. I, uh, Mike. Yes. I do have one question. Sure. <clears throat> There is a about a half hour period tomorrow where I'm I have to step out of the meeting. So is that I want to make sure because I know before there was the issue around quorum. So I want to make sure that I'm not going to affect quorum. I think we'll be okay. Uh, Justice Moreno, will you be here tomorrow? Yes. 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 Tomorrow. Yes. Uh, Judge Espinoza. Uh, I haven't heard of anybody else who's expecting to not be here. Yeah, so I, I think, and uh, I, although I don't think Marvin could sit in for you, uh, Senator Skinner, it'd be great if he could, if you feel well, like- Well, my staff were monitoring the whole time. Oh, awesome, all right, perfect. Don't worry, I'm being staffed, it's just that I personally will have to step out. I, I completely understand, and, and, and Senator Burton obviously uh, had to step out early today too. So um, thank you all very much. And- uh, I'll be here tomorrow, Mike. Have a good evening. Stay well, everybody. Okay. Thank you. You too. I'm ending it. Thank you all. End it. End it.